Welcome to the third installment of the 2010-2011 NYU Reynolds Social Entrepreneurship in the 21st Century Speaker Series, a conversation with Endeavor CEO and co-founder uh, Linda Rottenberg. Uh, my name is uh, Gabriel Broadbar. I'm the director of the, Annals, uh, the Reynolds program. Uh, and I'm also someone who's really a great admirer of, uh, of Linda Rottenberg and, uh, and her work with Endeavor. Some of you might have been with us this past Monday uh, when we had an evening with um, Kickstarter co-founder Martin Fisher. Uh, and I think he, he really put it very aptly when he said, Linda Rottenberg is a true example of a, what a social entrepreneur is and what a social entrepreneur can do. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about the huge impact that Endeavor is having on, uh, on emerging markets around the globe uh, by identifying and supporting high-impact social entrepreneurs. And I know we're going to learn a lot about her thinking behind Endeavor and how she grew it into what it is uh, today. Before we get started with that, though, I just want to take a quick minute to tell you a little bit about the NYU Reynolds program. I'm going to uh, um, show, we'll show a short video about Endeavor, and I'm going to introduce you to, uh, to one of our fellows as well. So for those of you who don't know, and for those of you who were here on Monday, forgive me, because this will all sound very familiar. Uh, but the NYU Reynolds program attracts, trains, funds, and encourages graduate students from across, and undergraduate students from across 11 different schools at NYU who hope to become the next generation of social entrepreneurs. So you may be asking yourself, what is a social entrepreneur? Well, the short version is a social entrepreneur is somebody who finds new ways to solve old problems. And they do so in ways that attack the root cause of the problems and not just the symptoms. So what do I mean by that? Uh, a social entrepreneur, for example, who's concerned about hunger doesn't simply start a new food bank, although that's a great thing to do. Rather, that social entrepreneur is going to figure out ways, ideally on a global scale, to help people grow and sell food for themselves. Or a social entrepreneur that's concerned about sick people doesn't simply try to get a few more doctors into countries where they're badly needed. That social entrepreneur might develop a new cell phone network so thousands of doctors in remote corners of the globe can share life-saving information about their, about their patients. And a social entrepreneur that's concerned about poverty in emerging markets doesn't simply flood those markets with aid. Rather, that social entrepreneur is going to figure out ways to increase opportunities for entrepreneurship so people can lift themselves out of poverty. And these are all real examples of things that Reynolds fellows and scholars are doing now. And they come to the Reynolds program because they want to try to turn ideas like these into reality and do so in ways that are sustainable and scalable. Other people come to the program because they're interest, interested in building and sustaining that infrastructure that's needed for these ideas to really take root and flourish. So I'm talking about the lawyers who are trying to create the new legal entities that social entrepreneurs need, or the computer programmers and the hackers that are going to create the task-specific technologies to help social entrepreneurs realize their visions, or the finance folks who are going to help ensure that capital is available for social entrepreneurial investment or investment in social enterprises. And then a third type of critical change maker that uh, the, the Reynolds program attracts are the advocates. Those people who want to spur others to meaningful action on a large scale. I'm talking about the documentary filmmakers, the activists, the journalists, the authors. So if this you know, sounds like you or it sounds like somebody you know, I very much encourage you to, uh, to learn more about our program. We're actually accepting applications now for our class of 2011. Uh, you could check out our website, you could follow us on Twitter, you could join our Facebook page, you could subscribe to our podcast channel, all the uh, contact information uh, is, uh, is in the brochure. Um, so uh, before I um, start the video, I'm going to provide just a quick introduction of one of our fellows who will follow the video is uh, Daniel Sott. Uh, Daniel is a Stern-Wagner dual degree student. Uh, he's part of the incoming class of 2010. Reynolds Fellows. He's also a 2010 Lisa Goldberg Fellow in Philanthropy and Public Service. And his focus is really on applying market know-how to solve social problems. Uh, from 2005 to 2010, 
Uh, he worked at the Tides Foundation, primarily as a senior financial analyst. And while there, he helped to develop and manage infrastructure tools for not-for-profits, for philanthropists, for activists, the kind of tools that they need to ensure they can have their, the biggest impact possible, and which really makes him a, a very appropriate person to, uh, to introduce Linda. So why don't we um, start with the, the video, and then, uh, and then we'll hear from Daniel. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, it's a true honor for me to introduce Linda Rotenberg, uh, co-founder and CEO of Endeavor. As a joint degree business and public service student at NYU Stern and Wagner, and one of those uh, Reynolds Fellows passionate about infrastructure development for social change movements, it's a real uh, inspiration and role model uh, for me to introduce Linda, Linda to you all. Both traditional entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs alike need effective systems to develop, launch, and manage their operations. They need robust financial and performance management processes. They, need, they must consider the metrics and data necessary to measure and track their success. They must create a sustainable supply chain and conduct thorough market analyses to ensure that they have a viable business model. Oftentimes, they need all these things and much more before they even begin to seek capital investments. The problem is that in many emerging, e market, many emerging markets, that infrastructure is simply nowhere to be found. So that's where Linda comes in. She recognized that in developing countries, there's a powerful, untapped resource of big thinking individuals who can create and run innovative, high growth businesses. Businesses that can create thousands of jobs, millions of dollars in value, 
and affect the lives of, of countless others through inspiration and, and, being, and being role models to others. So in 1997, Linda co-founded uh, Endeavor with the vision of building high-impact entrepreneurship in developing countries. And herein lies the, the key to Endeavor's approach. Provide these entrepreneurs with the infrastructure that they need to realize their visions. Help them develop core comp competencies, provide networks for advice and mentoring, as well as other support systems that they need to thrive and create value while transforming entire economies across the globe along the way. So I know we're gonna learn a lot more from Linda about how Endeavor takes on the most significant barriers that uh, emerging, uh, emerging market entrepreneurs face. But what strikes me as the most, uh, what strikes me most about Endeavor is that they're not a bank. They don't finance their ventures directly. Rather, they recognize that oftentimes the greatest challenge facing emerging market entrepreneurs is not finding capital, but this more essential lack of infrastructure. Once an entrepreneur can prove that they can create value, along with the right mentoring and networks, then capital will flow from there. So Endeavor's success is in achieving sustainable economic development is undeniable, as we saw in the film. Before they began their work, the word entrepreneur did not even exist in Spanish, Portuguese, and Arabic. 14 years later, a few illustrations of their success. They've selected over 500 entrepreneurs from 328 companies across 11 countries, resulting in over 130,000 jobs created. On average, Endeavor companies employ 225 people in 2009. In 2009 alone, Endeavor entrepreneurs generated over $3.5 billion in revenues and raised $92 million in equity. Companies averaged 64% growth rates in their first two years after engaging with Endeavor, and 95% of those companies are still in business. So recognized as Time Magazine, recognized by Time Magazine as one of 100 innovators for the 21st century, by the World Economic Forum as a global leader for tomorrow, and by Schwab Foundation as one of 40 top global social entrepreneurs, please join me in welcoming Linda Rotenberg. Thank you, that was great. Welcome. Okay, that was such a great introduction. I think I'm done. You've learned everything there is to know about Endeavor. That was wonderful. And thank you, Gabriel, for inviting me to this Reynolds program speaker series. Um, in fact, just a couple weeks ago, I was here at NYU uh, for the Social Enterprise Conference. I won this uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. So I'm becoming quite a regular around campus, and it's really wonderful to be back. I think what NYU is doing to foster the field of social entrepreneurship is incredible and it's great to be a small part. And um, as Gabriel mentioned, my friend Martin Fisher was here uh, from Kickstart and he has run this amazing initiative which, as you know, has lifted millions of farmers in Africa out of poverty uh, by providing these human-powered irrigation pumps. And I think when you listen to stories like ours, you see that social entrepreneurs come in different sort of shapes and sizes. And I hope that this entire series of uh, lectures gives you exposure to a wide range of social enterprises and that many of you kind of end up joining, joining the cause if you haven't already. So I'm going to spend most of today talking about my own journey. And I know that uh, David Gergen, uh, CNN uh, analyst, uh, board member of Teach for America, one of my friends, kicked off this series. And he said that social entrepreneurship was the most important movement in this country since the civil rights movement. And it does seem these days like everyone is talking about social entrepreneurship, from Davos to New York, the New York Times to right here at NYU. But it wasn't always like this. Just 20 years ago, uh, people had no idea what this term meant. Many people still don't, but it, it wasn't even in the lexicon. And it took pioneers like Wendy Kopp, whom I met back in 1999 when she was writing her business plan for Teach for America, brilliantly disguised as her Princeton senior thesis. And Wendy persuaded me to become her first campus recruiter. And she nearly got me to drop out of Harvard altogether, though I told her I wasn't quite ready for the Bill Gates dropout model. And it took brilliant minds like Bill Drayton, the founder of Ashoka, and really one of the pioneers of the social entrepreneurship movement. And I was fortunate enough to start my own career, or as Bill would call it, my apprenticeship at Ashoka in 1994. 
And yes, it took crazy people like me and my co-founder, Peter Kellner, who thought up a new model for global economic development rooted in support for high-impact business entrepreneurs. So where did the idea for Endeavor come from? Well, if you want to get technical, the idea on my end came in a taxi cab. I was in Buenos Aires, fresh out of Yale Law School, and I was talking to my driver who mentioned that he had a PhD in engineering and couldn't find a job outside driving the cab. So I asked him the only logical question at that point, which is, why aren't you an entrepreneur? It was the era of Netscape and Yahoo. All my friends wanted to be entrepreneurs. And he said, a what? And I said, entrepreneur, you know, someone who starts a business based on a new idea. And he says, oh, impresario, shaking his head and using the word that's associated with big business, corruption, and greed, rather than innovation and growth. And it dawned on me in that taxi, there was, as Daniel said, there wasn't even a word in Spanish, or at that point in Portuguese, for entrepreneur. And across Latin America, as in many emerging markets, businesses fell into two buckets. There were the mom and pop shops, some receiving microloans for $50 or $100 at the bottom of the pyramid. And at the other end were these gigantic enterprises, all run by the same 10 families in each of these countries. And they secured the $50, $100 million in private sector investment. So what about everyone else? What about these scrappy young visionaries who had built a startup, reached an inflection point, and didn't know what to do next? Where did they have to turn for advice, financing, inspiration? There was the gap. There was our big idea. And Endeavor, which is incidentally uh, headquartered just a stone's throw away in Union Square, we wanted that Endeavor to be a new kind of nonprofit, one that wouldn't just dream big, it would produce tangible results, one that went beyond handouts, aiming for sustained economic growth. We'd be entrepreneurial ourselves, putting it on the line, our core principle, go big or go home. The idea was to go into emerging markets through and through a unique judging process. Think about American Idol meets 12 Angry Men. We'd find what we called high impact entrepreneurs. Not just anyone, but those with the highest potential for creating jobs, generating wealth, and serving as role models. And after finding these diamonds in the rough, we'd mobilize top local and global business leaders to take them under their wing. Mentoring, training, opening doors. And as Daniel mentioned, Endeavor wouldn't operate as a fund and hand out money, but we'd like be neutral, like Switzerland, building a bridge of trust between capital providers, business leaders, and entrepreneurs who qualified for Endeavor's seal of approval. Bill Draper, the early venture capitalist, uh, once described Endeavor as venture capital without the capital. And in fact, um, I say that this served me very well for about 10 years because there's a big distinction, venture capital without this capital, uh, between us and Silicon Valley, although it became a kind of interesting during the financial crisis because I was like, venture capital without the capital, just like you guys. <laughs> um, anyway, or Thomas Friedman would later call us mentor capitalists. And as a sneak preview, if any of you uh, subscribe to the Wall Street Journal or buy it on the newsstands this weekend, uh, the Wall Street Journal magazine is featuring a two-page spread on me uh, this weekend entitled The Not-For-Profit Capitalist. So this sounds pretty reasonable, right? Well, not back in 1997. Most people just were not buying the concept. Uh, you have to remember this was right after the Asian flu. The Thai bot had collapsed. Emerging markets were in disarray. No one thought we'd find entrepreneurs, let alone be able to trust them in any of these countries. And in fact, I have still have these ding letters from foundations saying funding Endeavor was completely out of the question since we weren't helping the poorest of the poor. We were just building a middle class. To which my response was, hey, wasn't the answer to every college history exam essay, no bourgeoisie, no democracy? They didn't think this mattered. And, and venture capitalists, as I said, they called us crazy because they thought there are no entrepreneurs in the quote unquote third world. We don't even look any at any outside of Route 128 and Sand Hill Road. Why would you go down to Latin America or Africa or the Middle East or Southeast Asia? This doesn't make sense. And as for my parents, well, I love them, but they thought I was completely nuts. Uh, one day I overheard my mother lamenting to a friend saying, oh, Alan and I sent Linda to Harvard and Yale only to have her take early retirement. 
And I wasn't the only person to get this reaction. In the late 1990s, self-described social entrepreneurs didn't appear to have a legit profession. No one un understood what our deal was or why they should care. But instead of losing, losing hope, I hit the pavement. Translation, I became a stalker. And I, I say this a lot, and I, I, in all seriousness, I believe that stalking is a seriously underrated startup tool. <laughs> so there I was, greeting potential donors on the treadmill, outside of restrooms, racking up a million frequent flyer miles along the way. And at one point, Peter Kellner had set up a meeting with, for me with Eduardo Elstein, a big shot realist, Argentine real estate tycoon, who's famous for turning George Soros at that point into the largest real estate owner in Argentina. Eduardo agreed to a 10 minute meeting for me, so I had to get to the point quickly. Five minutes in, sure enough, Eduardo starts looking at his watch, and he says he'll do what he can to secure an appointment for me with, with George Soros. I said, thanks, but I turned the attention back to him. And I said, listen, you're an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur, Endeavor is about supporting entrepreneurs. Eduardo, I want your time, your passion, and $200,000. So at this point, the, the meeting had been in English. He turns to uh, his right-hand guy and says, esta chica está loca. <laughs> and he says, it's kind, he goes on in Spanish saying, you know, it's like you're in a bad movie where she seems so charming and then you go into the shower and she's coming at you with a knife. <laughs> so Eduardo didn't realize that I understood Spanish, so I said, Eduardo, estoy decepcionada. I am disappointed. This from the guy who walked into George Soros' office and walked out with a $10 million check you're lucky I only asked you for $200,000. He signed on the spot, agreed to become chairman of Endeavor Argentina, and to this day, he says, it's the best investment he ever made. With help from early supporters like Eduardo, in 1997, uh, Endeavor launched in Argentina and Chile, where we began support scouting for these high-impact entrepreneurs. And we found them. We met people like Juan Casares, of the 23-year-old son of a sheep farmer in Patagonia, who had a crazy idea to start a stock trading website. He told us he'd been turned down by more than 30 investors, unable to secure $100,000. So Endeavor came in, mentored Wences, and helped him raise $4 million from Chase and Flatiron Partners, not far from here. Two years later, he sold a majority stake in Patagon, which sure enough became the leading financial portal in Latin America to the tune of $585 million. Wences credited with inspiring the entire internet revolution in the region, became an instant role model for other entrepreneurs, including Endeavor entrepreneurs he since mentored and fund. He now sits on Endeavor's global board. And in fact, just this week, you may have heard about Google's biggest deal in history, the acquisition of Groupon for $6 billion. Well, earlier this year, Groupon made a couple of investments, one in a German site and one in a Chilean site. The Chilean site, Clan Descuento, uh, is founded by two Endeavor entrepreneurs who, when they were selected, an article in the Santiago newspaper ran an art, uh, under the headline, Los Boys de Wenceslao, the first key investor in Clan Descuento, now part of Groupon Latin America, soon to be part of Google, Wences Casares. As for the very first pair in Argentina, in fact, the people who were Wences' role models, um, we selected a pair of young Procter and Gamble escapees who were determined to create the staples of Latin America. And by the way, I should mention, when we found them, they had 0% equity in their companies. This is often what happens. People come to us, they're these great entrepreneurs, they have this great opportunity, and yet, because there's no traditional venture capital in these markets, they come, Andy and Santi had 0% equity in the company. And one of the first things we did is help them go back to their investors and said, this is crazy. These guys have no incentives. They're going to leave tomorrow. So we helped them renegotiate their, their deal. And today, they mentor others and say, don't make the same mistakes we did. Well, they achieved their dream and, with Endeavor's help, were eventually bought out by Staples. For years, OfficeNet co-founder and COO Santi Belinkis sat on our um, Endeavor's board in Argentina, and last year, Andy Ferrari became the first Endeavor entrepreneur to become chairman of one of our boards. Another pair, sticking with Argentina, um, as many of you may have heard, is Mercado Libre, which was this eBay of Latin America, which went public on the NASDAQ 
uh, in 2008, with a market cap exceeding $2 billion. And Marcos Galperin, uh, the CEO and co-founder of Mercado Libre and the CFO, also sit on Endeavor Argentina's board. 80% of that board are Endeavor entrepreneurs, paying it forward for the next generation. And this is part of the intention that Endeavor will become of, by, and for entrepreneurs. So as people started hearing these stories, the tone began to change. And more and more, people started returning our calls, a stalker, no more. And foundations, some of them, started to get a little bit of what we were about. And venture capitalists certainly started seeing opportunities in emerging markets, setting up regional funds. And yes, even my parents stopped calling me crazy. And of course, the Endeavor story isn't unique. We're part of this continuum of the rise of social entrepreneurship. This whole field changed almost overnight from this loose band of renegades, these crazy people, to a respected movement. So how did this happen? Well, certainly it had to do with great organizations like Ashoka and the Schwab Foundation, which really supported um, social entrepreneurs. But I personally also think the tipping point had to do with three developments, or more precisely, three guys. One, Bono. Bono. Really, in 2006, the rock star morphed into social entrepreneur by launching Product Red, a global branding campaign to fight AIDS in Africa. Overnight, social entrepreneurship became cool. Two, in late 2006, Mohamed Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize for his pioneering work with the, micro, with the Grameen Bank and microcredit. Finally, our movement had an identifiable leader. And three, in Davos in January 2008, Bill Gates announced he was stepping down from Microsoft to start a foundation for global health and education. An iconic business leader had gone social. Our movement had moved mainstream. But as the Reynolds Foundation program stresses, individuals can't do it alone. It took larger trends. For one thing, you know, when, when we were starting back in 1999, it was just at the, uh, 1989, when I met Wendy Kopp and when Bill Drayton was really getting into Ashoka, when things like City Year were happening, when people started to see social entrepreneurship moving. Think of it, the, wall, the Berlin Wall was just sort of coming down. And I think what we started seeing was the rise of democratic capitalism and, and the trend that really Tom Friedman best identified as the world becoming flat. So suddenly, ideas could spread and that a social change, which really had been a very local phenomenon, started in one community with one school or one hospital, suddenly a model could go from Toledo to Tunis to Taipei. And I think that is a big change that has enabled the social enterprise movement to really take on new scale. And there was another growing trend, um, which was that government can't do it alone. Government didn't have all the answers. I think that people um, before had seen this binary world where either the private sector and markets were going to solve it or the social or the government was going to step in. But we've realized there has to be a third way. There are gaps where mar markets are failing and yet the government doesn't have the capabilities to step in. So from healthcare to education to the environment and I would argue to economic self-sustainability, there's only so much that policy can achieve. And there's sometimes the right incentives don't exist for the private sector to step in. And so social entrepreneurs really are often needed to, to bridge the gap, to find the innovations to these complex problems. And so we're, we became capitalism with a human face. And in the case of Endeavor, uh, the moment I felt we were really starting to be taken seriously was 2007, when Endeavor had already launched beyond Latin America, six, we were in six markets, including Brazil and Mexico, uh, we had launched in the year before in South Africa and in Turkey. But in 2007, um, I was asked to co-chair the World Economic Forum's regional forum in the Middle East in the Dead Sea in Jordan. And I have to admit, I was a bit nervous. We were in the middle of a two-front war in the region. There had just been yet another flare-up in, in Gaza. So the Israel-Palestinian issue was once again center stage. And I had flown halfway around the world to talk about entrepreneurship, economic development, and hope. It seemed a little naive. Was there even an Arabic word for entrepreneurship? Would our model resonate? Would I be taken seriously? 
the only woman on the, the, I was the only woman, the only social entrepreneur, the only person under 45, the only American. And so on top of everything else, I had an extra thing to worry about, which is what on earth would I wear? And more on this in a minute. So a few minutes before stepping on stage, I literally called my husband and told him, I want to come home. And he, but here's what happened. I got on stage. I told Endeavor's story, including Endeavor's recent launch in Turkey. And after the talk, I was swarmed by people saying, we need entrepreneurship in the Middle East. We need jobs. We need Endeavor. Several top business leaders from Amman and Cairo pledged on the spot to launch Endeavor, which we did. We launched Endeavor Jordan in Egypt within a year. I couldn't go home. Endeavor had to go big. So now in 11 countries, including Egypt and Jordan, we're right now this month launching Endeavor Lebanon. And just a few weeks back, I took this crazy one-day trip to Dubai, uh, where Endeavor announced at a celebration of entrepreneurship for the region uh, an alliance with Abraj Capital, the leading private equity firm in the Middle East, um, which pledged to help accelerate Endeavor's expansion in the region. And I was flying back from Dubai, I realized you know, the significance of what Endeavor's trying to do in the region. My whole life, I've really had a specific passion for the Middle East. Uh, it's funny because I've spent so much time in Latin America, but for me, the Middle East has really uh, held a special place from my very first international trip in 1984 with my parents to Israel to a second honeymoon with my husband in 2004 to Iran. But in that 20-year span, how many missiles have been launched? How many peace treaties have been signed? How many Camp David summits have been held? The old techniques have failed. We need new tools, mentorship, role models, venture capital, jobs, it's estimated that the region needs to create 100 million jobs in the next 10 years. And signs are really positive. And just last year, uh, Maktoub, the first online Arabic portal, was bought by Yahoo. And today, Endeavor gets scores of business plans and people saying, hey, I'm going to be the next Maktoub. Just as people said, I want to be the next Mercado Libre, or the next Patagon.com, or the next OfficeNet. We have people all the time saying, I want to become the next Maktoub, or I want to become the next Aramex, founded by a good friend, Fadi Handor, who's on our boards in uh, Jordan and Lebanon. And Endeavor has found it only takes a few of these success stories going viral. We found the same thing in South Africa and beyond. It only takes a few of these stories for a new culture of entrepreneurship to emerge. So young people can say, hey, I want to do that too. And for risk taking, investment, a new culture to take root. And in Endeavor's own portfolio, we have lots of examples in, in the region. Um, for, for example, there was a guy named Bulent Chelebi, who was a very successful Silicon Valley entrepreneur who went back to um, Istanbul with his family at the age of 50. And people said, you're ridiculous. You're this well-known engineer in Silicon Valley. You've made it. Why are you going back? Do you even know anybody? He said, no, but I feel it's time to go back to Turkey. He became an Endeavor entrepreneur. We introduced it to him to um, some of the top business leaders who became his investors. And today, it's a $50 million wireless company that's growing in Europe as well as in the MENA region. Um, as the a video mentioned, Imad Malhaus is uh, using software that's securing borders, not only in the Middle East, but actually US sheriff's offices are applying uh, his Iris Guard rec recognition software. Or take our 500th entrepreneur, Ahmed Metwali, selected earlier this year in Cairo. A techie since youth, he co-founded Timeline Interactive, which produced the world's first downloadable uh, video game in 3D out of Cairo. Now, and he's also, I should say, hiring most of the engineering graduates coming out of Cairo. And like Andy and Santiago, when we found him, his one problem, he had almost no equity left in his company after his first round of financing. Um, so after uh, a, a big discussion where he was almost not selected because of how poorly this venture capital group had been treating him, I walked out to our, um, a, I thought, dinner and finally getting a drink after I'd moderated this very tough discussion. There were going to be 300 people. I had to get my thoughts in order. And of course, I um, get stopped by this guy saying, uh, Linda, I just want to uh, mention that you know I'm so-and-so, and I was just sitting in back. I thought it was an interesting conversation. I'm like, oh, yes, see you at the dinner. He says, no, 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 wait a minute. 
I'm actually part of that VC firm that there was a lot of discussion about. I said, oh, hello. <laughs> and he said, no, really, um, my partner and I are here. We'd love to sit down with you at dinner because we want Ahmed and his partner to stay. We want to see if we can renegotiate the terms. We'd like your help in understanding how we can do this. So this is a role endeavor playing. But anyway, back to uh, the three D downloadable games. I have to admit, you're not going to catch me playing cell cell factor psychokinetic wars. But I have been convinced by a number of, of entrepreneurs actually that gaming is a very good metaphor. We actually have a lot of gamers coming out of uh, Buenos Aires and uh, Cape Town and um, and um, and uh, Cairo. And I think it's all about risk taking and innovation. But I want to. I know we are going to move soon to Q and A. But I want to give a postscript on that Middle East event. Some of you heard this a few weeks earlier. Because remember, I've been the first female coach. I've been a bit nervous about what to wear. So I had tried my best to channel Queen Rania. And I came up with this chiffon outfit that I thought was you know, elegant, yet appropriate. Um, and about a month later, I wear the outfit uh, to the friend who had sold it to me. And she pulls me into the bathroom and says, Linda, come with me. And she says, you're wearing this all wrong. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, your head is coming out of the sleeve. <laughs> so when we formally launched Endeavor Jordan in front of most of the Hashemite uh, uh, kingdom's cabinet, I issued a formal apology to his majesty, King Abdullah. Um, but what I want to end before the Q&A is really with what I call um, our period of growing up. And in fact, th uh, two weeks ago, Endeavor held its 13th anniversary celebration. So I called it our bat mitzvah. And I said, you know, this is really about growing up. And I think this is the question that social entrepreneurship has had to answer. We've gone from trying to explain to everybody who we are, what this term meant, why we're all crazy, to now proving, I think, after Eunice, that we're not a one-hit wonder, right? That it's not just microcredit that can scale. And I think that the three things that Endeavor is looking at, and I think the field that it's whole, as a whole are looking at, are scalability, sustainability, and impact. And I think that I'll, I'll end here so we can ask questions. I'll address some of these in the Q&A. But I think that just that's, to me, going to be the next stage, is when you look at uh, the history of entrepreneurship, you can name scores of companies. And when you look at it, you look at Cisco, you look at PayPal, you look at Google, a lot of these enterprises spawn others. And so um, when I left Ashoka, I told Bill Drayton, look, I want to endeavor to be seen as kind of like what the Googlers and the PayPalers do. You launch uh, social entrepreneurs. I hope one day we'll have people trained at Endeavor that go find the next innovation. Because I think social enterprise has to get to the next level. We have to have the equivalent of IPOs um, for our social enterprises that go big. We have to learn how to retain talent. The other big thing I say a lot is when we don't have overhead, we have people, and that we have to start investing in people who make the leap to come into social enterprises. Um, in venture capital, you talk about funding A teams, A ideas with A teams. We have to start doing that. So I think about when we think about scalability, sustainability, talent retention, and the field as a whole, this is an exciting new stage. But I think one of the last things I'll say is we have to get out of just these founder syndrome. And I think that um, we needed to have the rock stars. We needed to literally have the Bonos and the Muhammad Yunuses. But I think the danger is that it's all these personifications of all of us. So just in the last um, month, I've made a personal decision um, that, that will become public um, early next year. But you'll, well, now it will be on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> the age of Twitter. Um, uh, uh, I recently decided to split the role. I'm remaining as CEO, but we are bringing our managing director from Mexico, who's been with us six years. His name is Fernando Fabre. He's fantastic. He's Mr. KPI. He's done incredible things in Mexico and has really uh, the respect of the entire organization. And I invited him to move to New York, which he will do in February, and assume the role of president. And so he will be taking over day-to-day -day operations. And to me, what's been most interesting, I have to tell you, is that the number of people who've come to congratulate me 
um, and really sort of made it seem like this is a strange decision. I'm like, what do you mean it's a strange decision? I've been doing this 13 years. Endeavor's growing. We've built this cabinet. Fernando was the missing piece. I can't do everything. And they said, yeah, but this doesn't happen in social enterprises. And I thought that was a very interesting reaction. And so I really am excited um, to continue growing up with this, this field that I love. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Say your name and get right to your uh, question. We could we get a good conversation going. I'm Ali, I'm a student at NYU also, and yes. having interned at Endeavor and Ashoka, actually, wanted to ask you about the difference, the most important difference between what you see as a social entrepreneur and a high impact entrepreneur. Yeah. And it came up earlier with Daniel mentioned sort of the difference between a traditional entrepreneur and a yeah. social entrepreneur, and how Endeavor sort of operates in a different realm of yes. entrepreneurship. And um, mm -hmm. You alluded to this at the end, like the idea that we have to move out of just being in a social entrepreneurship to scaling and growing. So, yeah. <clears throat> sorry, what's the most important difference to you? Um, I'm, I'm a social entrepreneur, but Endeavor supports business entrepreneurs. And we support not just business entrepreneurs, but high impact entrepreneurs. So we'll, when we look at our portfolio, I would say maybe 10% could themselves, even though they're private sector, for-profit companies, 10% probably now qualify under what's being accepted as, a, as the definition of social enterprise because they're dealing in healthcare, they're dealing in clean water, they're dealing in, in education in some ways, even as for profits. I would say 90% of our companies are in everything from you know, IT, biotechnology, automotives, uh, luxury goods, retail, uh, and it's about job creation. For us, we felt the missing piece that Endeavor could add value to was this high growth, high impact entrepreneur that it's about job creation, it's about wealth creation, it's about being the first employer to give equity to your employees, it's about um, paying double or five times or ten times the minimum wage. It's, it's, this was a missing piece that we felt in emerging markets needed to address. So I think that we're, we tend to look for the kind of venture worthy um, companies. Um, but there's a lot of overlap. And look, I think I'm very close with uh, Jacqueline Novogratz of Acumen, with Bruce McNamer of TechnoServe, um, Martin Fisher himself. I think what's exciting to me is there's not one size fits all. There's not one panacea. We're all working at different spectrums of the private sector development, in, in my case, um, sphere. But I believe that um, in Endeavor's unique role is focusing just on the highest impact business entrepreneurs. They don't have to have a social purpose. They have to grow, they have to be sustainable, they have to create good jobs and be good employers. And we found even with that, that is doing a lot in the social space. Great. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, you actually started to answer it, but I was hoping that you could speak um, a little bit more about the trends that you're really following or that you're excited about in terms of the measurement of social impact. Yes. Especially for enterprises like yours that don't necessarily correspond to the normal ways that social, or even social impact investing. Yes. I'd, l I'd love you to talk about that. And also, to, I'm curious as to what degree you feel that Endeavor can, in fact, take responsibility for like, all the profits or all the jobs sure. that are created sure. by an organization that it mentors. Thank um, you. Sure. I, good, two good questions. Um, let me start with the first. Um, uh, we take impact measurement very seriously, in fact. Uh, we're, we're really known for this, and um, our annual report is called an impact report for that very uh, reason. And in fact, yeah, we have this. And in fact, if you see, we've always done this kind of uh, five by five matrix, and we, we look at the, um, the jobs and the revenues and the, um, the entrepreneurs still, still in business and looking at all those facts. We felt that wasn't enough. So what we've been doing, uh, we started two years ago with something called Where Are They Now? We looked at every single entrepreneur from point of selection to today. Where were they before they met Endeavor? What inputs did we do locally, globally? Where are they today? One factor which is just interesting is we found that of the 135,000 jobs generated in the $3.5 billion last year alone, 
um, we that 66 percent of the jobs and two thirds uh, and 75 percent of the revenues um, were generated after their involvement with Endeavor. So I think that's just an interesting fact that we didn't just take companies. That was the the rap on us. Did you just take companies that were successful anyway? Well, it's hard to say in emerging markets. Even if you're a three million dollar company, you're not necessarily going to get to become a thirty or three hundred million dollar company. You need those supports. But we went a step beyond that, which is we started something called the Endeavor Center for High Impact Entrepreneurship. We're really trying to um, look at our data against you know other other entrepreneurs of of similar sizes to find out what happened. So for example, in South Africa, we did a survey of the employees of Endeavor companies where we looked at um, uh, as a, a cross-section not only um, just the census data, but we looked at the siblings of the employees to control for socioeconomic background. And what we found is the companies of South Africa were playing significantly more. They were providing significantly better health care, which in South Africa is an especially big deal because of the, the, the AIDS epidemic. They're providing education opportunities. And that two-thirds of the employer, employees who worked in Endeavor companies said they were more likely to become an entrepreneur themselves. But I've, I've asked a lot of venture capitalists. And even at you know, Kleiner Perkins Square, they're like, we don't know how much we are responsible for the growth of Apple and Google. We like to think with our best investments, we just kind of get out of the way. So I think that what we're trying to do is, on the one hand, uh, measure ourselves as clearly as possible. There's always that question, you know, did Harvard pick people or did they educate the you know, people they could have made anyone um, you know, uh, turn in, from their business school turn into the, the, the moguls? This is a question that I think we have to grapple with. Uh, what we say at the end is, or what I say, our biggest benchmark of success that I want us to judge ourselves on is not just the growth, it's are the entrepreneurs giving back? Because if they see value in this, that if ultimately we are sustained by entrepreneur give back, they're now giving back um, either percentage of equity or, or cash or profits or combination, you know, that, that will say that they felt that this was worthy. Um, but we don't have all the perfect answers. We're not going to completely get it right. But I think as a, success, as a sector, what I'm in favor of is I find it very hard to judge, I think we box ourselves in if we say these are the triple bottom line metrics for everybody. I find that's a great exercise in theory and practice, it's very hard. What we've tried to do is say, on our own terms, how can we be as rigorous, as thoughtful as possible? What can we do from a qualitative standpoint in terms of surveys and then this, uh, this longer essay form? And what can we do on a quantitative aspect? And um, one of the things we're always asked is, what about the control group? What about the people who didn't get selected? And what I will say is 20% of our Endeavor entrepreneurs now are people who didn't make it through the first time. In fact, just yesterday, I was visited by a Colombian that flew all the way to Cape Town, was rejected, and they wanted to know what the feedback was, and they're coming back. So 20% of our entrepreneurs, but I always laugh and say, oh, yes, that's a fantastic idea about this control group. You have companies in emerging markets where it's pulling teeth to get their financials anyway. They're threat they believe everyone everyone's out to get them to begin with. And what we'd like to say is, thank you for being rejected. We'd love to follow you for the next five years with no hope of selecting you, just to prove how lousy you are and how great we were not saying, selecting you in the first place. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. My, I'm Alex. I'm also in UAU here. Um, I would like to know, I mean, I see that you're focused on emerging markets. Yes. But I would like to know what you think of the applicability of your model and the support especially you offer in developed economies, especially those that are in crisis maybe, such as Greece. I'm from Greece. so. Um, well, I have, uh, people always say, what's the framework for selecting endeavors markets? And I always say that the Overall, we say that in countries transitioning from international aid to international investment, and we have a list of, of emerging markets, um, we then have this pull from the, the private sector where people are now calling us literally in Indonesia and in Saudi Arabia saying we need Endeavor here, and so having the business sector to pull us in. Um, I also personally say that I'm asked, well, why aren't you in Eastern Europe? And I say, well, you know, I have a personal additional thing that we don't publish, which is good food and good weather. So um, I've been a huge proponent that Greece, Italy, and Spain really should qualify their submerging markets, um, although people have pointed out that that could apply to the US now, too. 
Uh, so far, my board has not um, bought that. But actually, my um, college boyfriend, a very good friend, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, who um, was a venture capitalist in Greece, is now senator, has been arguing for Endeavor to come to Greece. Um, I, I don't know. I think we're open-minded. I think right now we are looking to be in 25 countries in the next uh, you know, three to seven years. And we're right now having scoping. We just launched Lebanon. We have scoping teams at this moment in Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, Kenya, Peru, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, the rest of the Gulf, um, Morocco. So we have a lot um, going on. But I was, I've was i given talks in Spain in particular um, uh, and definitely think that um, Spain, France, Italy, uh, Greece, uh, that we see very similar things in terms of the barrier and the, and the cultural blocks to entrepreneurship. So I'm personally in favor. I just need to have a few more board members come around. <laughs> Hi. Yes, hi. My name is Will. Um, I was wondering if you're at all aware of the predictions of Ray Kurzweil and maybe possibly his belief that um, there are going to be strong development in artificial intelligence in the next um, 10 to 20 years. Uh -huh. If you would be at all interested in a long term um, investment in something like that that seems far, a little further off in the future. Wow. That's interesting. <laughs> um, I don't know. God, I'm not usually stumped. I, don't, I think that's fascinating. I mean, I think that we, we don't do anything here in the, in the US, but I think that I will be on the lookout for entrepreneurs in AI in emerging markets. I'm sure some, there are some Brazilians out there in Rio. So if you're out there in emerging <laughs> markets, artificial intelligence, Endeavor, we're there. I think it's great. Look, I think what's excellent about uh, well, I'm passionate about entrepreneurship because of things like this. Because we have no idea what's coming next over the horizon, but somebody's going to think of something we never thought was possible. And I think the exact things that seem kind of crazy one day are taken for granted the next. It's so interesting to me that when I talk, have my, my, my talk now, it seems like, of course, this, what's new about this? This is the point. Ten years ago, it was crazy. The things that seem crazy today are the things that you know, we have in our living room tomorrow. So that, to me, is the beauty of, of this whole field. Hey, um, there's always this discussion about the A team uh, with the B plan and the B team yes. with the A plan. Yes. Um, and you brought that up, and I yes. thought it was interesting because uh, whatever happens when um, it seems that like all the A teams with the B plans or A plans go ahead, but what about the B teams with the A plans? What's sort of being done with that? Um, it's an excellent question. This is referring to um, an oft-told venture capitalist parable that they would rather invest in the A team with the B plan than the B team with the A plan. You know, Endeavor subscribes to that philosophy, I think, both in our own uh, talent retention and in terms of plan talent plans, but also in the entrepreneurs we select. We, will, we, we bet on the person. What we will often say is we'd rather turn down an idea that seems terrific if the entrepreneur just doesn't seem like they have the capabilities to be the person to do it, or that they're a complete one man, one woman show and can't bring anybody around him or her. We've turned down um, entrepreneurs. And there have been a lot where the, the strategy is not quite right. And the business plan that needs to be tweaked. But you're so convinced that people are going to want to get around this team and help them get to the next level that that doesn't seem so bad. And to me, that is the decision that the best investors make in the private sector all the time. And so it does, it's my, one of my personal pet peeves that we still live in a world in the nonprofit sector where people say, what's your overhead? And I believe investing in people is key. And I believe that even with an endeavor, when we started, I said, we're going to have the smartest talent there is, but we couldn't pay a lot. And so we got people for a couple of years who then went on to the best business schools. And that was great until we got to a more mature age where cycling people out every two or three years, it just wasn't helpful. And we needed to keep people five years, 10 years. We needed people to think that this could be a career. Well, unless we're going to take that seriously, unless as a field we're going to figure out how to retain people, how even if the, 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 you know, even if the upside is not going to be there, people are not going to make what you could do if you're IPO. We have to figure out the market comparables for the talent that's needed to address these complex problems. Because if we don't, we're not going to find the solution. So I'm, I'm really passionate. And I believe that people like Tom Tierney, 
who left Bain to, find, to found Bridgespan. He and his team at Bridgespan, and there are others, really doing terrific work. Omidjar Network, that's one of our supporters, is looking into this. Because I think the field needs to get more creative. There are a number of hybrids around that are sort of for-profit, not-for-profit. We have to do everything that's within the, the, the letter and spirit of the law, but that really is thinking about if you need these complex solutions solved, if you need really strong strategies, what's the team to solve it? Um, and I think we've got been a little, little backwards here by saying, you know, what's your overhead thing and not even addressing what the problems are or what the strategies or business plan is. You would never do that in the private sector. And I think that um, this is one of the areas in which we need to, as a field, kind of take, put more insight into. Hi, my name is Vinay. Um, Hello. Thank you for coming. Uh, my question has to do with, uh, you obviously have three priorities, which is high impact, sustainability, and job creation, I think. Yes. How, how do you guys go through the process when those are sometimes in conflict with each other? And do you have an example yes. of that? For example, I could, like say, a petrochemical company might not score so high on sustainability, but may score very high on job creation. And so where, where do your guys' yes. priorities lie? And how it's great. My, I mean, I mentioned that American Idol needs 12 angry men. I, we just came back. I flew to Cape Town for 30 hours whoops, after being in Dubai for a day. Um, and it was one of my favorite things because we had people, we had the CEO of Gucci, we had some of the top investors from South Africa, we had uh, Vincent May of AAA investors from, coming from New York, we had Mexicans, Colombians, uh, Egyptians, and South Africans all as candidates, and we had a panel deciding who meets the Endeavor criteria. And you know, we believe it, we, so that process, we've screened 22,000 entrepreneurs to get to the 500 entrepreneurs from 328 companies, right? So these were 11 companies being judged that had been screened from about 300 from the, from the four companies. And by the time they came to South Africa, like all our international selection panels, they had a two-day series of meetings with these top investors who came together six at a time and had to debate and unanimously select the Endeavor entrepreneurs. And we do that purposely because our seal of approval, we want it to have been debated. And these are the questions that come up all the time. Well, there's going to be a trade-off. A lot of the companies that have huge in IT may have to start an office at some point in Silicon Valley. What does that mean for the local job creation? How much engineering talent is there? This other company, we have the Spoleto, the fast food pasta company. It's now employing 4,800 people, 4,300 now going to 4,800 people. But is it really, how innovative is it and is it really scalable outside of Brazil, right? So these are the kind of conversations. And so in our case, we created a portfolio approach. And so we end up having four profile types, what we call the diamond in the rough, the surefire success, the local star, and the barrier breaker, to kind of address this and say, look, there, there are different kind of categories. But within those, we want to bet on the stars. But we need kind of a mix, a mix of different industries, a mix of different types of people and age range and backgrounds. Um, and then through the where are they now and other projects, we can then see what are the trends, what have we learned, what works, what doesn't. But I think to me, um, I always call Endeavor kind of a Jeffersonian democracy. We don't have a checklist where people come and then just sort of you add the score up and then that's the answer. It's this constant debate that, that we have. And um, we have a stakeholder approach. And I think the, other, the last thing I'll say, I'll end here, but to me, um, I, I said this at, at, at HBS a couple of years ago, and I think it's even strong, the point is even stronger today. When, I, when we started out as social entrepreneurs, we said we were applying for-profit tools and for-profit principles to solve social problems. So the, the pinnacle was being seen like the private sector and being as business-oriented and strategic as the private sector. Well, post-Enron, post-Wall Street financial crisis, I believe the tables have turned. And I believe in terms of global governance, in terms of a stakeholder approach, in terms of the psychic equity for employees, in terms of a stakeholder approach where we have our customers, our entrepreneurs have opinions, our board members have other opinions, our funders have different opinions, our, you know, the people who are mentors have others. And we've had to have this stakeholder approach in multilingual, you know, cross-cultural dialogue. And to me, you don't get to top down easy answers. It's a little bit of a messy process. But at the end of the day, you have to have more buy-in. And I think that as corporations are globalizing, they're realizing that this one quarter, here's the bottom line, here's the shareholder value approach, doesn't work anymore. They're actually having to have these more messy conversations. And I think that social entrepreneurs have been doing this for decades. And I think what's really interesting is, as I kind of use my metaphors, um, we're now getting a seat at the grown-up table, right? And I think that when we negotiate, whether it's with corporate partnerships 
or whether we're just talking, it's not about us being the little brothers and sisters that are taking these private sector tools. We have a lot of learning to give in a global world with complex stakeholders and complex problems. We've been thinking about these in a much broader way. So to me, that's the other exciting trend, back to trends, is that the private sector and government have a lot to learn from social entrepreneurs. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Eliana. Hello. Uh, for many complex reasons, the high um, impact entrepreneurs happen to be men. Uh, I wanted to find out if Endeavor um, is employing any type of strategies yeah. uh, to provide access to women entrepreneurs um, in Latin America. Yeah, I think that's a great, a great question. I think that um, uh, there's some degree in truth to that. I think in any culture, I mean, I'll take me, I mean, I, I have five-year-old, five-and-a-half-year-old identical twin daughters, and I was taking them to school this morning. I was coming to prepare for here today. I have to pick them up for, you know, ballet practice later. You know, it is very hard to juggle. I think in emerging markets, it's sometimes even harder because um, I can't believe I'm going to say this and my husband's going to get to hear it on Twitter. But yes, men do help out a lot more here. No, but I think that, so it's, so it's, <laughs> he's going to use this in so many arguments. Anyway, um, <laughs> please. <laughs> so marital bliss, this is important. So, <laughs> um, but I think that um, we noticed about two years ago, two and a half years ago now, that only 8% of our portfolio were women because when you're looking at employing hundreds of people and millions of jobs and revenues, it wasn't just kind of mom and pop shops. It was precluding a lot of the women that were doing you know, bakeries or, or clothing stores, but, but did they really need to think big? So we did a couple of things. Number one, we actually worked with Goldman Sachs and 10,000 women. Dina Powell is a friend of mine to get case studies written on some of our top women entrepreneurs. People had taken, you know, they're like the L'Oreal of hair care in Brazil, these two women who grew up on the favelas in Rio and created a $40 million, 1,000-person employee company. I mean, big stories. And we started telling these stories, and suddenly we started seeing more applicants. We also um, got a grant targeted in some of our countries, and I know Chile and, and Turkey have done this, to actively look for women entrepreneurs. Keep the same criteria, and we've seen huge growth. So now I would say closer to 18% of our portfolio is now women. It's 15 to 18%. And in the countries that have actively been looking and then using this role model effect, it's much more. I believe that this will start to change. I believe that if we can, a combination of the stories plus the internet, it's interesting. We've gone from a series where most of the engineering graduates were men, right, even here, um, that, that the, the, there's not as many founders, to the fact that the internet a lot means you can create businesses from home. You can create these online businesses. So we have a company in Turkey, Hiref, that is doing um, these beautiful like vases and decorative work using Turkish culture. They became the first non-EU company to sell their goods over Amazon um, this, uh, this, this year. We have companies, jewelry companies, in Egypt and in Brazil, um, started by women. And again, the online is going to make it be not just about franchising your stores, but going online. So I actually think this is going to change. But I'll end by saying this is not just a problem of emerging markets. And I was just at the Fortune, you know, Most Powerful Women conference, and it was shocking, actually, to see how few of the Silicon Valley CEOs were women, and really how many of the women actually were no longer at the, at the, at the helm. So I think that a lot of times, I'll end here, it's been a very humbling experience coming from the US, where the other, the, the, the other trend I will say and, um, is when we started out, we said we were trying to sprinkle some of the magic of Silicon Valley in some of these places where the talent existed and the drive existed, but people were told, you can't think big. And we said, if we can just sprinkle some of this kind of fairy dust, of Silicon, then, then, then it will happen. And that's happened. And now when you go to Rio or Istanbul or Cairo or Cape Town or Jakarta, there are so many people who believe they can actually make it. You see what's going on in India and China. But guess what? The number one question I'm asked on campuses today is, um, can you take some of that magic and kind of bottle it up and bring it back here? And to me, one of the scariest things, and I think Tom Friedman's been writing this a lot, is how do we in the United States not lose, the, lose this entrepreneurial drive? How do we not, you know, not close doors for this next generation? And I think that this is, I never thought I'd come to a day where this is the question I'm asked more and more. 
But I think that now we see people, we see women, we see young people in these cultures who never had an opportunity thinking so big. And we see people here thinking, I'm not going to have it as good as my parents did. And so I think that that's our biggest challenge is how do we kind of get our mojo back? But thank you, and it was a great, great question. <laughs>